to Digital Trust World on Authentication Day. Passwordless authentication has been one of the key themes for today, and we're going to explore it in more depth with our expert panel from Intrust. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A function, and we will endeavor to answer them at the end of the presentation. If we run out of time, because uh, we need to finish in one hour's time, then I will forward those questions on to um, our experts, and they will be able to answer them directly. Um, I've, known, I've got a history with Entrust. I've known uh, Entrust since the 1990s, so this is really aging me. Uh, when I was at Citibank in London, I was using PKS7 PKCS, PKCS toolkits to develop a secure platform for international payments, and that seems a long time ago. Uh, I, I then led a team uh, to build a managed uh, certificate authority, a CA for a major UK systems integrator from the ground up using TrustKit in the early 2000s. And now here we are, 20 years later, discussing passwordless authentication with them. I believe that Entrust has the vision, the resources and the technology components to ensure that they stay at the top of the digital trust industry. And I welcome them, them here for this discussion. I'd like to go around the, first of all, could you introduce yourselves, um, Jenna and Rajan, just before we start? Sure. Uh, thanks, Alan. I'm uh, Jen Markey. I'm the Director of uh, Product Marketing for our Identity uh, Business segment. Thanks. And I'm Rajan Barara. I'm Product Management Director for Identity Business Unit at Entrust. Thank you. Right. We'll start. The, I'll start the presentation now. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, welcome, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about uh, the passwordless future that we've all been promised and we all desperately, I'm sure, wanna know where it is. So I'll give you a very quick uh, intro, talk a little bit about how we got here from a passwordless perspective, go through some of the different passwordless options that are out there and uh, Rajan will go through some specific use cases. And as Alan indicated at the outset of today, uh, today's session to please um, get your questions ready and we'll go through them at the end of today's panel. So with that, um, just a quick uh, overview. I mean, Alan just uh, gave a kind of a, an overview of the, the breadth and the um, length of uh, time that we've been in the security industry. But uh, from an interest perspective, you know, close to a billion dollars in annual revenues. We have been in the security industry for 50 plus years and in digital security in particular for 25 plus years. Um, over the course of that time, you can see that we've, we've um, trusted with protecting 100 million plus different identities that are out there. And obviously you can see the breadth of the rest of our portfolio from certificates through HSMs to the physical access control side and beyond. So it's just a high level overview of who we are and what we do. So I'm not probably telling you guys anything that you don't already know. I mean, it's uh, it's pretty uh, it's pretty uh, easy to say that nobody loves passwords. Um, there's a very widely quoted stat from the uh, Verizon Business Investigations report that you know 80% of all data breaches can be tracked back to compromised credentials, and in most cases that is the Password, so a huge security vulnerability, and a source of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, folks in IT staying up at, at night. From a user perspective, just think about your day to day. I don't know how many times you've uh, either had to log into something at work or check your um, banking information, or maybe you've bought tickets somewhere. But if you think about it, you know, from a user perspective, we have an incredible number of passwords. I think the average internet user has 150 plus different passwords right now, and the more passwords you have, the more likely you are to write them down to reuse them, to recycle them and beyond, which creates you know, the vicious circle of more passwords, less secure, <laughs> keeps going. And all of that largely happened before the last 18 months. And we are all very aware of what happened over the last 18 months of time and how that has further intensified the threat landscape. Some of the uh, common identity-based attacks that you will see out there, phishing. So, you know, looking to basically do not click on that link, uh, either in that email that you got or on a website uh, where somebody's trying to, you know, steal your information. I saw an interesting story yesterday where people are starting to use the LinkedIn shortened URLs um, for this particular, uh, for phishing purposes as well. So uh, be careful out there. Brute force attacks, you know, basically they're trying to guess what your uh, username password combination is by just kind of like slamming it through again and again. Credential stuffing is the use of stolen credentials to illegally access different personal accounts. Um, then there's the whole uh, area around intercepting, uh, you know, throughout the network activity to get people's passwords and other credentials. And then keystroke attacks are basically are able to maliciously install some piece of a malware on someone's system and uh, the keylogger basically, you know, every time you type in your banking password or something, it, uh, it keeps that. So those are some of the most common identity-based attacks that I'm sure 
uh, we have all unfortunately seen or heard of um, through the course of business, normal business and even consumer. So this gives you um, a brief history of how, how did we get here? I mean, we've been talking about pastoralists forever. I mean, that's kind of the, the nature of the today's panel. Um, and so, you know, you think you go way back to 2004 at um, the RSA trade show and Bill Gates was the one who's saying, you know, I, I think passwords are over. Well, that's 17 years ago. Um, you fast forward a little bit to 2009, push notifications came out. That is a, a form of passwordless and pretty commonly used for consumer applications today. Um, in 2011, IBM came forward and said, you know what? We don't think passwords are going to be around in five years. Well, 2016 was a long time ago. Uh, then you've got the FIDO Alliance uh, launching uh, at the same time, the same year that uh, Touch ID debuted on the Apple iPhone. Um, you've got the WebAuthN L1 standard, which published in March 2019. If any of you were at the uh, Gardner IM event in December 2019 before the world went crazy, um, many of people talked about that being the passwordless event. The whole the whole conversation was about passwords. All the vendors talking passwordless. So it's now 2021, and this is kind of the, the nature of panels. Where are we now? So why passwordless, and and why now? So if you look at um, this particular Gardner stat, um, you know over the Gardner stat here on the left hand side says that by 2022 over 60% of tier one enterprises will have implemented a form of passwordless. And some of the reasons for that, there's the intensified threat landscape. I know we've probably seen ransomware go nuclear um, over, the last, um, over the last year in particular, and that's getting you know, worse and worse. And so if you've got the single largest security vulnerability being the password in intensifying landscape, you definitely wanna like get rid of that one first. You've got this permanent, or what's going to now likely be a very permanent hybrid workforce, and you've got the continued people working in uh, relatively insecure, unsecure home office environments from coffee shops and whatever. And again, that creates a certain exposure, especially if they are um, using poor password hygiene habits, like you know, looking up in their little day timer um, as to what their password is, if they're sitting in a coffee shop or leaving that around, say on their coffee table at home. There's just the ability of the technology itself um, from um, mobile apps, um, push technology out there, that it is ready. You know, it has reached a certain level of maturity and readiness for passwordless to really be broadly accepted. You've got um, heightened user expectations, whether it's um, on the consumer side or the workforce side, with digital natives coming into the workforce and increasing numbers, they expect to you know, operate at business online the same way they buy this stuff on Amazon. So really those expectations for secure and frictionless access are definitely also driving um, the passwordless trend at the moment. And then you think about, you know, password administration tends to be the single largest time suck that um, that an IT administrator has. And if you're looking at, you know, the global shortage of IT skills, of IT, IT talent out there, you need to make the most of that available time, both to retain that talent, because it's not really um, an exciting time to be changing passwords all the time or doing password administration and password policies, but also just there's so many other things that have to get secured and, and done with this environment. And then there's this whole hybrid multi-cloud environment that we're living in. Cloud migration is well underway. And so really the need for you know, better visibility of credentials across all those different identity providers. Because you know, if you use um, a, you know, Microsoft Cloud or Google or, or AWS, each one of those cloud providers comes with its own identity concept. And so that makes it all the more complex um, for password management and provisioning and passwordless you know, can provide that seamless user access. So those are some of the, you know, the key tenants as to, you know, why passwordless, but why now? So then we've got this passwordless spectrum. So, you know, all passwordless solutions are not created equal. There are several of them um, out there in the market, everything from mobile push notifications through to FIDO keys, through to credential-based authentication. You know, it, from an interest perspective, as, as Rajan will go through later on, we do them all. Um, but it's just sort of what is the right use case for you? And, you know, if you start, you know, obviously at the bottom left, you've got passwords being insecure. As you move forward um, towards the right hand side, a passwordless experience. So a lot of the different implementations that are out there, they are passwordless experience as far as the consumer or the user is, con is concerned, but it still uh, relies on underlying passwords. So you still have that security vulnerability that's out there. Um, if you still have, if, you, if you're in a situation, say, um, like in the FIDO world, where you are offering them the password experience, but you're still backing up to some underlying password, even in the, in the Microsoft announcement, you're still relying on underground underlying password. If you mix that with adaptive authentication, it's a bit more, more secure, but there's still that you know, central point of failure, that password underneath the whole thing. When you go towards the extreme right with passwords credential-based authentication, you're using a digital certificate 
um, in lieu of the password. So it's gone altogether. So when you no, no password, no password hacks. So the most secure solution uh, possible, but you know, it, it really depends on what the use case is. It can be a little bit more complex, very good for high assurance workforce use cases, may not be, you know, suitable for a consumer use case. But those are sort of the, the, the lens of the different passwordless solutions that are available out there. Before I pass it over to Rajan, I thought I would share a little bit about our own passwordless journey at, uh, at Entrust. So, you know, way back, you know, 50 years of security expertise, uh, way back, you know, starting with the password, but as you get into, you know, the mid eighties, multi-factor authentication, um, you know, two or more factors to be out there, uh, you know, in the, in, in roughly 2013, we um, got involved with derived PIV credentials, which is sort of the first iteration of certificate-based password authentication. So that's like eight years ago now, which is quite a long time when you think about it to be in the passwordless field. Um, mobile push somewhere in the mid um, uh, 20 teens, and then um, you know FIDO uh, towards the 2018-2019 um, uh, timeline. So that gives you an idea of you know where we've come from from both an MFA and a passwordless perspective, uh, and how the world itself has evolved at the same time. And I don't think you'll find another vendor out there that can lay claim to having eight plus years of uh, passwordless experience in 2021. So with that, I will pass it over to Rajan. Thanks, Jen. Uh, let's get on to the next slide. So as Jen was mentioning about different uh, spectrum of passwordless, how the technology changes. So some of the options that uh, we have seen in the market is A, using mobile push authentication, which means whether you want to log into your desktop, you want to log into your um, uh, mobile, uh, sorry, uh, cloud apps or any of the native apps, you get a push notification on your mobile device, iOS, Android, et cetera, and you log in. Now that doesn't completely eliminate the password. It just replaces password with push notification. It just skips the password side of things. The second one is FIDO authentication. Now FIDO has become global standard, very commonly used in uh, workforce and consumer industry. Uh, you can log in using a FIDO key, which you can get from uh, various companies off the shelf in the market, from Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. The beauty of this is all you have to do is take the key, plug it into the USB port or NFC or um, uh, via Bluetooth, and you're enabled. Recently, more and more keys are coming up with biometrics enabled also. However, FIDO leaves it as a proof of possession, which means that if I have the key, then it is mine. If you have my key, then you can pretend to be me as long as you have the key, unless it is biometric enabled. On the right side is credential-based authentication where PKI certificates are used. Now, whether it is a hard key or a mobile device, which we call mobile smart credentials, there is PKI certificates and credentials and keys, et cetera, stored inside the mobile application or the key. And that's the key which can be used to unlock your computer, to log into your applications, et cetera, et cetera. What they the advantage of this approach is that A, you can use um, PIN to unlock these credentials and those PIN, that PIN is only known to you. So it is not just proof of possession, it is also a proof of your identity. Secondly, you can use biometrics on your mobile devices, whether it's facial recognition, touch ID, to unlock your credentials that can then be transferred securely to your computer and then you can continue working on that. So it's a different set of passwordless options. Each one of them has its own use cases associated with it. Um, if you're using FIDO key, you can log in passwordlessly into your um, banking application, your Office 365, your Salesforce, your VPN, et cetera, et cetera. However, if you have credential-based applications, uh, to log into your computer, then the main advantage is you can also use it for encryption, for document signing, for email signing as well. Next slide, please. The way our mobile smart credential application, which is credential-based, which is PKI digital certificate-based application on your mobile device works is we establish a secure Bluetooth connection with the computer, doesn't matter if it's Mac or Windows or any version of Windows, once that secure connection is established, the user is prompted to say, hey, would you like to log into this computer? When the user says, yes, I want to log in, 
and has authenticated themselves using biometrics, the PKI credentials are used to log into the computer. Once the user is logged into the computer, they can log into remote desktop, secure shell, any other privileged access applications, or into any cloud applications that they want to. It's a complete single sign-on without having to re-authenticate. So as long as the proximity with the computer is maintained and that proximity can be configured, the user can continue working. And when the user is done working, they just pick up their mobile device, walk away, or if they have a key, they unplug the key and they walk away from there and the computer gets locked or the user can actually be logged out. Now, this is a very high assurance um, PKI-based application. So it, it can be used for email signing, encryption, very simple to deploy, and also very easy to use because it's biometrics enabled. Next slide. Let's take a look at how the user interacts with this application. So here, Chris is um, waiting for his mobile smart credentials to be activated over the air. It takes a few seconds as the keys are exchanged and his mobile device has now become his key, not only to log into his computer and applications, but also physical access. So as he walks into his cubicle, he goes next to the computer and this can be a shared computer or his personal computer. As he approached the computer, it was actually prompting him to say, do you want to log in? He says, yes, I want to log in. He used his fingerprint and he was logged in. He can continue working uh, with email, whether it's Outlook, whether it's on the Office 365 and browser, Salesforce applications, et cetera. And once he walks away, the proximity-based login kick, logout kicks in and he's logged out of the computer. So this is a very big advantage that as he walks in, he's prompted to log in and it can be any computer shared or his personal. And as he walks away, he takes his mobile device with him and he's logged out. Compliance is very key uh, part of this whole thing. Next slide, please. But we conducted a tech validate survey and looking for our customers to say, what are you looking for actually? One of the things that the customers told us was they want the, the solution, which is passwordless solution to work with both Macs and PCs, not just Windows or just Macs. They want to provide one-time user registration, not to be able to move from one device to another because there are a lot of shared computers there in their, in their environment. They don't want to have to re-register every now and then. They don't want to be limiting how many users can log into one computer. And they don't want to be registering um, their authentication mechanism for passwordless on an application by application by application basis. So a single sign-on was very important for them. It should work with any, any application, cloud, on-prem, any computers, desktop, VDI, et cetera. They want people uh, the, the solution to be able to work with um, their existing environment rather than upgrading the hardware or software, adding cameras, infrared cameras, or any fingerprint readers to the computers, or even having to upgrade their operating systems because there are a lot of applications which depend and, and, and in large enterprises, it can be a complex undertaking. Um, and they, they also wanted um, high assurance PKI based option if available because they could have a broader use case like email signing, encryption, et cetera. Next slide. Having looked at various um, surveys that we conducted and talked to various customers, what, what, we, uh, what we have seen in the marketplace is that the use cases which our customers and various other customers are looking to use passwordless for is computer login with desktop, Windows, Mac, whether it's VDI, secure shelling, privileged access uh, users, single signing on to legacy apps, cloud apps, whether they're SaaS or their own apps hosted in cloud. They want to be able to expand to prevent frauds like email phishing so that email signing and encryption becomes important. They want to protect their data as well as make sure that when they are communicating with their customers, with each other employees, they sign their emails. So it is guaranteed that the email is coming from the source that they're talking about. 
There are other use cases where document signing, whether you're leasing something, whether you're interacting with your bank, the mortgage documents, et cetera, the bank employees want to be able to sign the documents with authenticity. So that's another use case. So given those use cases, let's take a look at another demo. Now here, the person doesn't have, sometimes people don't have uh, mobile devices. They, they can use a key. So that password access works like the person plugs in the credential keys. And at that point in time, if the credential key does not have uh, biometrics, they will be prompted to enter their secret pin, which can unlock the key. Now, once the key is unlocked, they log into the desktop and the desktop is ready for use. They can continue working for as long as they want. And as they're leaving, they will unplug the key and they can get logged out. So that's how the passwordless experience for various users can work. Thanks, Alan. Over to you. Thank you. I'm back. Now, there was a, a question from, from the audience while we were doing that, and you may have answered it in that last actually video, is, is a question from Mike on uh, uh, what happens if you haven't got a mobile phone or you forget your mobile phone. And I think you may have just answered it with the, um, uh, the key um, kind of use case. Yes, Alan, absolutely. If you, lose, if you don't have a phone, definitely that key is an option. If you do lose, you happen to lose your phone and don't have a key, you can get a key or, a, or, or, a, or another device. Um, but key is the best, best, best option. And if you, if, you, if, you have, if you lose both? Okay. Um, if you happen to lose both, um, and, and it again depends upon various um, use cases. For example, if you want to be able to log in using a specific um, uh, one-time generated code, you can fall back onto that. And for that, you'll have to call into your administrator. That's one option. Another option is if, the, if it is a high security arena and you don't want anybody to just log in, then you have to go and get a alternative key or uh, equivalent credentials. Sure, sure, yeah. definitely. Could you, uh, following on from that presentation, Rajan, could you please share a few typical customer types and their associated use cases for passwordless authentication? Absolutely, Alan. Um, so we have, we have the wide variety of use cases, wide variety of verticals from where our customers come in. One of, for example, one of the customers is a large uh, financial organization. They wanted their employees to actually walk up to their computers, have this user experience of with their mobile devices to log in. And as they leave the office and, and they, they use a lot of shared computers to be able to log out from there. It was more from compliance perspective, from PCI DSS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They want to be sure that once they have logged out, they're gone. And while they're logged in, they're able to use the certificates, et cetera, not only for logging in, but also for signing and, and, and uh, encryption side of things. Then, we have a lot of federal government customers who use this mobile smart credentials, a lot of uh, three letter, four letter agencies. Sure. They wanted very high assurance credentials so that employees walking in can get access to privileged information, confidential information based on their, um, based on their clearance. Uh, and that's what this PIV credentials or high assurance yeah. credentials do. Um, we also have organizations from healthcare um, who are using this passwordless solutions, especially, for example, during COVID scenario when people were walking around um, and doctors were in their overalls with their PPE, et cetera, they didn't have um, any way to take out a physical smart card and plug it into the computer. So they were using these um, phones as patches on their arm or on their person. They were carrying it as they approached the computer. Computer would say, hey, do you want to log in? Please put in your... Pin, and they would put in the pin and they will get access to patient data. And they have expanded that use case to do prescription signing, um, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. So um, a question for you, Jen. Um, with mul multiple passwordless mechanisms around, can you please expand on use cases where one would use these mechanisms, e.g. FIDO and credential-based passwordless, passwordless authentication? Um, absolutely. I think I, I touched on this briefly, but <clears throat> sorry. Fido, the, Fido basically still relies 
on a password for initial registration. And the password can just exist post key generation. So it still has a potential security vulnerability, which you don't have with credential base. So if you combine FIDO with adaptive, uh, multi adaptive risk based MFA, that helps mitigate some of that risk. Um, but there's still some limitations to FIDO um, overall, which, which probably make it better suited to a high assurance consumer use case than a high assurance workforce use case. Yeah. For example, you know, if you think about FIDO keys, FIDO keys don't guarantee um, identity. They're based, they're on the basis of possession. So someone might have, might have taken that key from you. It doesn't really verify that you are who you say you are. Um, as well, FIDO, because it's not PKI uh, based, doesn't have, doesn't offer support for workforce use cases like email and file encryption, digital signing, um, email signing. So there's some limitations there. And then there's just sort of the IT admin overhead uh, associated with, you know, keeping track and managing all those keys. So I would say that FIDO is much, you know, it is a high, it's, it's much more high assurance use case than uh, say mobile push uh, authentication, but it's probably better to get to more on the consumer side or less secure, uh, if, if there's such a word for workforce. From the high assurance workforce perspective, really that's where credential based authentication shines. It, it replaces the password entirely with that digital certificate. It, um, which basically means, you know, you're transforming um, in, the, in, this, in the demo you saw from Rajan, um, you're transforming the, the worker's mobile device into their trusted workplace identity, regardless of where that is. And no password, so no password hacks. Uh, the other opportunity with credential base is you get all those things like email signing and encryption. So it really enables um, a lot of the workforce use cases. So I'd really say um, that I would, you know, if I, if I was in high assurance workforce use case, I would definitely lean towards credential base. And for other use cases where you require an added level of security than just mobile push, FIDO works. Um, but I really would say that it's not high assurance workforce. Sure, yeah, um, it makes sense. Just kind of a, an aside question. Does um, organizations, if they're doing cert-based authentication, uh, do they need to run and manage their own PKI or is that something you can, you can offer on their behalf? Oh, we can, I mean, we can work with your existing CA if they have one, or um, you can work with our um, RCR or CRC on demand. And actually for the, for the premium workforce bundle, we include uh, PKI as a service up to a certain user account. So it's included in, with your, with the IDAS solution anyway. Yeah. Another question from the floor um, is in terms of, you know, you're, you're a major HSM um, supplier. Um, so for the, and there is, um, a range of um, TPMs and and, uh, and secure um, areas of a, of a mobile phone. Trustonic is, is the major one for uh, um, you know Android devices. So is is there? Do you get situations where you can also leverage the secure hardware on, on a mobile device for you know kind of um, cryptographic processing and also secure credential kind of storage? Is, is that something you kind of uh, um, um, you know, manage? And 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 is, is there demand for that? So, right. so Alan, definitely what, what we are seeing is that any time we are storing PKI uh, certificates and keys onto the mobile devices, secure enclave is absolutely important. So that's something like, for example, our mobile smart credential application is, is capable of doing, making sure that the, that the protecting keys are, are hardware protected so, so that it's not open to anything else. Uh, for for like you know defrauding and 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 plugging in debuggers etc. Another thing which we have which we have um, seen is RASP, which is real time application protection. So what ends up happening is we are wrapping our our mobile smart credential application, which is our identity application, into a wrapper so that no debuggers, emulators etc. can tap into it. So giving security from hardware protection as well as putting on top of that another wrapper layer so that um, in-flight, et cetera, cannot be uh, yep. hacked also, yeah. Yep, that makes sense. So to um, so, so kind of talk about modern, you know, we talk about cloud and adoption is, is, is uh, you know, is, is rising and, uh, and uh, you know, one, one of your slides showed the kind of the, the kind of external connectivity to kind of SaaS platforms like uh, Salesforce and, uh, and, and other cloud providers. Is, is, uh, is, how does pass, pass with us work uh, across multiple um, identity providers, I think probably for for, for, for Rajan, I think. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Alan. That, good question because I think where when we go out into various uh, enterprises, there are multiple uh, identity providers out there. So that is that is extremely important that um, 
uh, that the passwordless solution, any any passwordless solution that works out, works with multiple IDPs out there. Um, the way we work is we we federate with other IDPs on OpenID Connect or SAML. Okay. Yeah. And what ends up happening is they, as let's say, for example, there's XYZ identity provider out there, they will just hand over the, 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 the login to us. We will pass on the credentials back over OpenID Connect or SAML, and they can continue working. So if they have multiple IDPs, they can continue that. We can just fit in there with those IDPs over OIDC or SAML. Okay. That makes sense. So kind of, um, um, you know, during the presentation, you know, we kind of explored and, and Jen, I think, explored some of the, the kind of you know, the present um, adoption criteria and, 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 uh, and cases for, for, for passwordless. So, so what do you believe the future of, of, of passwordless, um, what does it hold? Well, I think, you know, we can all agree that, you know, passwords are long past their expiry date. And I think, you know, if you think of things like Touch ID, Face ID, some would argue that we're already operating well within a passwordless world. Um, I think we're gonna see further uh, adoption, acceleration of that adoption as we go forward um, because of some of the, the fundamental shifts we're seeing right now that you know that permanent distributed or hybrid workforce is definitely gonna be uh, play a key role here. The, um, the need, the, 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 the challenge around you know, getting enough IT resources and talent out there. So just not being able to um, you know, dedicate resources to tasks, which just aren't adding a lot of ROI at the end of the day. And just from a user perspective, the, you know, the password proliferation, the craziness just can't continue, right? We're already at, you know, 150 passwords. I mean, it, I mean, really it's well past the, the point. So I, I think it's just, it, it's, everything's combining to see a further uh, adoption. So I think, uh, you know, a lot of it near term, we've already seen a pretty, pretty broad adoption with mobile push notifications and the consumer landscape. I think um, as the threat landscape continues to intensify, because I think unfortunately that's also likely to happen, um, that it's those solutions um, like mole push won't be sufficient for enterprise level security. So I think what it comes down to, I think the debate is less about you know to go passwordless or not. I think that one's that one's sailed. I think it's really about you know do you go for adaptive risk based authentication with FIDO or do you do credential based? But what makes sense? There's some debate still around that. Um, but the decision to go password, I think we're, we're well past that. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Rajan, do, do you want to, to add anything to that, to that at all? Uh, I think uh, from what we are seeing is passwordless, like Jen mentioned, that passwordless, that debate has sailed, everybody's going into the passwordless direction. It's, it's, there's new, new technologies appearing out there on the horizon, um, um, whether it's it's going beyond PKI, we'll talk. We can talk about blockchain and and those kind of technologies which are upcoming, and also things like bring your own identity or self sovereign identities. So that's 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 developing, and that's something to keep an eye on uh, from perspective of both employee and consumer. Yeah, it it, it, it must mean you know, from a, from a you know an end user if I put myself back into that that hat of of, of the decision maker within an organisation. It's uh, it, it, it perhaps is there is a, a multitude of options that I can have and, and perhaps more choice than, than ever before. So so what's that differentiator you know, in terms of um, you know kind of your solution versus you know kind of kind of some of your competitors in in terms of competing technology? Right. Um, so one of the like like as as a decision maker. So when we talk to the CISOs, the CIOs, the chief digital officers of various companies, one of the things that we talk about is what is it that you want to resolve? What's the problem? What's the gap that you're trying to fill, or what's the problem you're trying to solve? So depending upon what problem they're trying to solve, our solution is better or equivalent to the competition. Where we are better is when it becomes a high assurance use case. We do support FIDO, we do support PUSH, not a problem. Like everybody else, we support those, those, those technologies and it'll continue working with our system as good as with others. The main differentiator is when you come into our solution, we will make sure that the solution works both with Mac, Windows and other mobile devices. Uh, you don't have to do any hardware upgrade, et cetera. Um, so if you're a large enterprise and you are on Windows 8.1, for example, or 8.2, and, and you're not yet going on to Windows 10. There, there are still quite a few deployments where we see there's a hybrid of all these devices and they don't want to go immediately there. So that's another part. 
Then if you want to do email signing encryption, you want to do digital document signing, you want to make sure that there is privileged access management and there's non-repudiation involved. That becomes extremely high use case for high assurance credential-based authentication. So when we are talking to the decision makers, we are saying, guys, look, if you want to be able to tailor the passwordless solution to the needs of different use cases, whether it's consumer or your employees, and within employees, different uh, class of employees in terms of some of them have access to privileged information, some of them have access to highly confidential information, and other ones are just um, day workers or knowledge workers, and they just want to continue working, right? Mm -hmm. So you can use Entra's solution to cater, just one single solution to cater to all those broad variety of use cases. Yeah. In, in, in obviously in Europe, we have, we have EIDAS. Is, is, is that a kind of, is that a pull for, for your technology? Because obviously it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a signing capability. A absolutely. From EIDAS perspective, absolutely. We are integrated with that EIDAS technology. Um, so from, from perspective of PKI, certificates being there, which are user identity, and then being able to unlock that and, and integrate for signing, that's definitely a big use case for us. Yeah, definitely. A um, couple, of, couple of moments ago, you, you, you referenced kind of um, bringing an identity and blockchain. So um, what's your view on market acceptance and status of, of, of those two um, technologies, kind of, you know, B BYOI and, and blockchain, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps treat them individually? Right. So, so BYOI is definitely very common. It's, it's very well established people, especially from consumer side of things, uh, people log in using their social logins, whether it's Gmail, Insta, Twitter, uh, you name it. And there are hundreds and hundreds of new social um, logins appearing um, everywhere. So people, people do log in using that. Um, that's very, very common. Now, blockchain is something that a lot of governments um, national ID programs, um, business um, identities from provincial or uh, state government side of things, they have started uh, experimenting or piloting with blockchain technology, technologies for identifying their citizens. So what they want to be able to do is to say, hey, given that I have, I have checked that the citizen is um, in Canada or UK or USA, and they have their passport, et cetera, they can be onboarded and they have their own blockchain identity. From there on, they can use it as a consumer, providing their identity to the bank so that when they are talking to the bank or interfacing with bank, they are providing them with a public key and that's, they get, the banks get the information that they need, no more, no less. Similarly, uh, with social media sites and other places, the same login can continue. Your employer, the same login can continue, but it's a different key with each one of them. So they won't be able to connect, for example, mm -hmm. today, uh, Gmail or um, uh, when you do Google searches, et cetera, with your identity, mm -hmm. they can connect you from being your bank and where did you visit and so on and so forth. But with this new blockchain identity, which is bring your own identity, a self-sovereign identity concept, you can actually... Um, start disrupting that. So you won't be tracked or you can not necessarily be identified being the same person logging into one site versus the other. So there, there, there is a lot of that which is in store for future, but not too far off also. It is happening right now. A lot of piloting is going on. Uh, same technology being used for even COVID-19 uh, vaccination certificates and, uh, and, and test results, et cetera. Um, even tracking the, the doses uh, from perspective of when, when the uh, vaccine doses leave the manufacturer and how it gets into distribution and which clinic it goes to. So all that is being tracked in the back end using blockchain technology. So, so what is the relationship between identity and authentication in, in, in that example then? So... Um, so in the example that I gave with blockchain specifically, the identity of the user is owned by them. So they, they know um, that they are the user and when, who, what their identity is, their name, their email address, all that stuff, that's with them. Sure. 
date of birth, et cetera. They walk up to, to, to a bar where they say, hey, I want to know if you are above 18 or not. They yeah. don't need to see. All they, they are doing is they're saying, I'm going to unlock my application. I'm authenticating to my application. I'm providing you my identity that I'm 18 plus. That's all you need to know, nothing more. Similarly, when, when you start going into taking that, that technology or blockchain identity and walk up to your employer and say, this is my identity. Now, the, now your I, employer will have to give you access to your email, your other things, et cetera, based on that identity. And they don't need to issue a new soft token. They don't need to issue you a new stuff. So then this, once that integration starts happening with the blockchain identity or the distributed identity of the user, the user can walk up with their own phone or mobile device and say, I'm going to log into all the applications that I have access to again with the key, again, based on cryptography. Yeah. It doesn't have the certificate, but the cryptographic underlining or underpinnings are the same. And they can say, hey, you know what? It's a high assurance authentication into all the applications that the employer can provide. Same with the bank. But, but it's, a, it's a different key being exchanged between the bank and the user and different key being exchanged between the employee employer applications. Yeah. So it, it, it seems to me it's getting a, a hell of a, a lot blurry as I, as, as I kind of, um, in, in my opening kind of presentations that I've been doing um, during the week, it, it's getting very blurry between, you know, some of the kind of the, 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 the kind of the pillars of, of, you know, authentication, identity and authorization. So we're kind of using credentials that have been issued by, you know, perhaps we're storing them in a wallet for authentication and we're using them also for perhaps to assert something, uh, permission, permission to buy a beer at a bar, permission to hire a car, permission to, to view adult content. So is that, is that a, is, is this a, is this a completely new way of, of for identification and authentication or is it just as kind of, um, or, or, or is it something else? I, I think, I think you're right. That line is blurring between authentication, authorization, identity. It's all becoming one. And that's, that's what I think um, from, from interest perspective, that's what we have been talking about is trusted identity. Now, whether that trusted identity is based on um, blockchain or it is based on PKI certificates or something else, it's the trusted identity which you bring. And at that point in time, uh, you get access to what you're entitled to get access to, which is the authorization part, et cetera. And then at the same point in time, you're authenticating with the same trusted identity. And on top of that, the consent and other things and only display the part or, or share the information that is required to be shared, no more, no less, right? So all these things get together into a single trusted identity concept. So I completely agree. These are all merging into one single concept. Yeah. And it's very complex because obviously there's different risk um, appetites. There's different uh, mm -hmm. different trust frameworks. There's you know from interoperability. There's different regulation between regions. So mm -hmm. um, you know I'm I'm a little bit skeptical about the, my identities of all the more to, to open up every door. So um, um, can you can you comment on that? So definitely, like you know when you're when you're crossing the boundaries, and that's where that's where I think if you go forward into the blockchain mode. It's not the same, it's the same identity conceptually as a user is the same identity, but you are sharing, you have full control over what you are going to share in terms of um, sub-identity, if I may say, which, which is kind of the key that you're sharing with each one of them is different. So, so you have, the user is more and more in charge or in central control of what they can or cannot share or what they want to share, and they have to have different kind of um, identity. So even if one key got stolen or compromised, they, 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 the other identities or other keys that they have shared with other organizations or applications are still intact. So, yeah. so there is definitely, like that's, that's where I, I believe that when, when you start talking about high assurance identity and, and then, um, if, if I were to raise it a little bit above and say at citizen level, for example, ICAO level standards, like yeah. International Civil Aviation Organization has, has issued standards for what um, mobile passports or electronic passports would look like, right? So they are based on currently underpinning is PKI technology. Yes. Right. So that's, that's a trusted identity, which um, 
when we travel from one country to another, we can share that identity and, and, and still be under the trust umbrella of the identity, right? So it's the same kind of technology that, that can be taken into distributed world like blockchain technology or continue using the PKI side of things with um, organizations uh, as employees, employer accessing applications or as consumers trying to access my bank records, et cetera. So, so I'm not, I'm not um, I, I would say that, that the trust when you talk about trusted identity and, and as long as the underpinning of that trust is, is well-defined by certain standards, whether it is PKI or at a higher level, IKO level uh, yeah. frameworks, we are good. Yeah. Or similarly, self-sovereign identity also. I think there is a, there's an organization, sovereign.org, which is very, very, very vocal about self-sovereign identity. Um, and, and they are bringing on uh, specifically for, for, uh, for refugees, immigrants who don't have the records, they are they are issuing them identity. So that, from that perspective, if you think about from people who don't have identity or papers to prove, how do they go about? That's another another way to look at different frameworks, right? So SSI Sovereign brings another framework to you. Yeah, excellent. So we've kind of I think we've um, opened up a little bit of Pandora's box on this, but uh, there's a there's a question from Federico. He says, "What precisely is identity?" Can you please define it? I mean, identification, authentication, or authorization are familiar and easy to understand terms. Yeah, I get that. However, perhaps from a philosophical perspective, what is identity? Is it an object? Is it a function? What is it? Wow, that's a question. Thank you, Federica. Bajan, are we, we stunned you in the silence? I'm, yes, I'm thinking about it. That's a very good question. <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, what precisely is identity? Huh? Is it an object? Is it a function? Um, yeah. So identity is 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 fundamentally uh, a reflection of what you are in physical world in in the context of today's conversation in the digital world. Now, it is, it is that proof of who you say you are. So that's where, and when you start proving that that identity is yours, that becomes authentication. And yeah. when you start using that identity to access applications and, and information, then the, the aspect, what you're entitled for, that becomes authorization aspect of it. When, when you go to a pub or, 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 or any other place where you need to show proof of age, that identity uh, becomes, again, a proof of who you are, similar to if you want to go get your driver's license, you need to be of a certain age. If you want to get order a drink at a bar, you need to be of a, of a certain age. So that becomes, uh, that, that, is, that is the identity itself. You're saying, hey, you know what? I am above 18 or things like that. So. So that's, that's how I see identity. It's not purely a function. It's not purely an object. It's not purely authentication. It's, it's, it's an enabler for doing all those things in the digital world or the world around today. Yeah, a, a good response. And it, it is an in, it becoming an incredibly fluid, I think, discipline, identity. And, um, um, you know, in, in terms of there's so many kinds of ways of, of, of proving identity and, and uh, um, I, th I think I think I think the, th the two main things for me, I think you know, especially from from being you know in, in working in this industry, and also um, from some of the comments and, uh, and and sessions we've had this week is 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 kind of accountability and governance, and I think that there are two key things in terms of you know a, an identity solution to to the kind of really key pillars. Um, you know, to, the, 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 you know, and and the question is on on you know decentralized and and self sovereign is do they have do they have that accountability income because we we are talking about you know transport and, and passports and Arkeo. I mean, there is there is definitely you know there's governance there's there's, there's standards there, there and there's accountability specifically to to enable me to get on whatever a boat a plane a train 
and then enter a particular you know, a particular country. So that that is underpinning it, and that, that's kind of so the fluidity I think of, of kind of soft sovereign and, and, and decentralized. I think is is for me perhaps it's because I'm in my mid fifties now. I'm finding it quite difficult to kind of conceptually get my head around. Yeah, no, I, uh, Alan, hundred percent. That governance piece of it and accountability piece of it is key in any framework, whether whether it is um, a self sovereign identity or, like you said, IQ etc. Very well established. Uh, similarly, mobile drivers licenses are coming out, so those 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 frameworks are also well established frameworks. Um, so whether when when it starts becoming a public um, public I in double quotes identity in terms of like, you know, if, if you have a distributed identity and I am accessing that blockchain identity, if my government issued it and there has to be some kind of international framework so that A, if I'm using that identity internationally, that should be, uh, there is a framework of governance. And same thing, like you said, if it is within, within the nation, then various provinces, states, counties, et cetera, they need to be able to rely upon that framework and governance, 100%. Uh, hopefully moving on to perhaps a, a less, um, um, complex kind of environment question. Um, we obviously saw in your in your presentation you, uh, you know, talked about some announcements we've seen from some big organisations, um, and obviously Microsoft has did a recent announcement on, on passwordless. So, so for both of you, what are your thoughts on 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 Microsoft's recent passwordless announcement? Well, I think, you know, it's definitely a step in the right direction. It's, um, you know, it's, it's long past, uh, past due and it's likely more insufficient for a lot of typical consumer use cases. And it does provide a much better user experience, obviously, um, but really don't think it goes far enough from the high assurance use cases, particularly workforce. Yeah. Um, you know, it doesn't, it won't support those, those things like email, file encryption, um, it again still backs ultimately to a password, which again, you're not addressing that, that huge vulnerability that's out there. And just you know, even on the consumer side, there's still a, a lengthy list of exceptions that are out there, you know, Xbox 360, um, Office for Mac 2011 earlier. I mean, there's just a whole laundry list. So definitely step forward, um, you know, kudos to Microsoft for, for, for bringing it to the masses um, on the consumer side. Uh, and it's a sign of things to come, but you know, I think there's still a lot further to go. And then Raja, what are your thoughts? Um, first of all, we, I think I think we we welcome Microsoft. You know, welcome aboard because we've been we've been uh, in this passwordless side of things with credential based um, and and other FIDO etc. for for a while now. Um, and and uh, the party was uh, getting a bit lonely. So so good to have Microsoft on board, a big player. Um, now Microsoft did announce passwordless, and one of the things that uh, that caught my eye was. In case you want to go back, user, you can go back and uh, switch back to passwords. So that was a little bit of a concern in my mind is that if, if I left my desk for a minute and somebody switched it back to password again, I'm locked out. Um, in it, it, without getting into more details and understanding what Microsoft and how Microsoft is doing it, apart from knowing that they're doing push notification. Um, I think there is still password somewhere, perhaps lurking around which the users can go back to, or if I were to be able to hack the password, I can still go back to that and enter the password on behalf of another user. That's what my thoughts are, but I'm sure that as Microsoft goes through this exercise of deploying these passwordless um, solution that they have proposed, they will receive feedbacks. They they can um, they can learn from our experience uh, in the field. Also, they are they are a good partner. So so Microsoft passwordless solution is definitely a step in the right direction. Yeah. Is is, is it um, is it is it based on Active Directory? Is it kind of, the, that's the depository? That's what you mentioned about passwords. So that's just where they're, that's where it's being stored? Yes, I think I, either Active Directory or Azure AD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The cloud environments. Okay, just checking to see if there's any more any more questions that you want, want us to answer on your behalf. Hopefully not as complicated as Federico's, but uh, we, we'll give it a go. So I don't think we have. So um, I think, we're going to call it a, a, a kind of um, end of the session today. 
as we're approaching the hour mark. And um, I'd like to thank uh, Jen and Rajan for your insight and the audience for your questions today and interaction. Our next session is at 7 p.m. UK time. Um, so 